so that we can get you all in the, in the picture. And um, I will, at this time, our rules are, we have some prepared questions that uh, we have done ourselves that, and some that we received from, from other people. We will present those, we will offer in the very beginning, each candidate will get um, anywhere from two to three minutes, depending on, to kind of tell what, who you are and, and why you want the job. Cassie has a particular question. And Cassie Westring will be asking the questions for all the candidates. And then at the end of each section, we will offer a few questions from the audience, uh, probably one to two minutes response time, and about that for the question time. Uh, we don't. We call it during a lot of time. We, we don't want to burn any more than two hours at this. <laughs> After a while, it, it gets it gets painful. So that's that's kind of our basic rules. And I'll ask um, Cassie to come up, and we'll get started. And our assessor candidates are Lindsay West, Renee Snyder, and James DJ Center. If you um, folks would come up here and take a seat, and if you speak closer to the podium, Josh can see you better that way. Visits with property owners. I 
measure improvements, I take pictures, I go back, update our computer system. I also follow up on all building permits issued in the county. The Department of Revenue requires you to earn your certification for property tax appraiser in six years and for the assessor four years. I earn my certification in two years. Um, the assessor's office has many duties. We transfer the ownership of all deeds. We give the veterans exemption to all those who qualify. We verify all property sales within the county. We follow up on all building permits and we do the physical inspections of all the parcels. We are also responsible for personal property and oil and gas. If elected, my priorities will be to meet the requirements of the Department of Revenue by visiting all parcels in Carbon County within six years, which were required. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm James J.J. Spencer. I'd like to thank the uh, Valley Service Organization and the audience for all you come to see me. Um, born and raised in Carbon County, I live in Rollins. I have a wife, Robin, and four children. I'm a Navy veteran. And the reason I'm running for this office is I think that being a Navy veteran, there needs to be more um, notice for veterans, more awareness out there for them for their exemptions. I'm also big believer in uh, cross-training in the office so that everybody is well-versed, it's a more versed office because knowledge is power. We got to have that. If nobody, if one person's gone on vacation or something, and nobody knows anything, it's kind of tough to have a good first office in there. Um, I'd like to continue with ways that the office is currently run, but I also want to bring new ideas into the office. And it's an opportunity to serve Carbon County born and raised here, and I know that your property and your hard-earned investments, that's something that if you have questions on, they will need to be answered. Um, I want a more transparent office where people can come into this office and talk to the staff in the office. I plan on keeping the current staff there because they are knowledgeable. I'm currently not certified in the office, but I've taken the initiative and already been with uh, touch with the Department of Revenue, Tax Division with Brenda Arnold, and she set me in the right direction on starting uh, getting certified ahead of time. So before even going into the office, I already have a little bit under my belt, and it's a, uh, I have a strong leadership and manager skills as far as being uh, from the military, and uh, thank you. On to our next question. How concerned are you about the ability of long-time resident, residents of Carbon County to afford increasing property taxes due to increases in valuation? Are there any policies you might consider that would help limit the change in valuation of a property between changes in ownership? In other words, do you think the assessor's office should have a role in ensuring that residents are not forced to move out of a home they've lived in for decades because they can no longer afford the taxes? Let's start with you, JJ. The state of Wyoming sets a standard in its uh, statutes and regulations from the Department of Revenue on how property should be assessed or will be assessed, and the assessor's office has to stay within those guidelines. Now, if the state changes their statutes and their regulations and it goes up, then there's your hands are tied as an assessor. Pretty much you can't go below the standard. But I want to keep it to where there is a set standard so it's fair for everybody. Great. Great. As Judy mentioned, um, the assessor's office is pretty tight as far as uh, what their fair market values are. Uh, 
Um, we have these standards and certain parameters. Um, you know, fair market value is supposed to be exactly what your home or property might sell for. You know, an arm's length transaction where both the, the buyer and the seller are informed. And really, you know, the market will change, but the property valuation, um, you know, within a given year pretty much is what it is. As far as increases in taxes, the assessor's office really has nothing to do with tax rates. Your fair market value is multiplied by um, the level of assessment, which is mandated by the state. That product is then taken by the mill levy, which is approved by the commissioners uh, with the budget request from the taxing districts in the county. So if your mill levy changes, your property taxes will change. Will change. If the, the state of Wyoming goes in and changes personal property assessment levels from 9.5 to 100% of fair market value, obviously your tax dollars would, um, would vary with that as well. But as far as the assessor's office, we don't make tax policy, we just get the fair market value. And as far as um, people losing their homes due to not being able to afford their property taxes. I know that there are certain um, assists as um, my wording here, but there are uh, there are places you can go to help you with that. There are programs in place to assist with those taxes, whether you be a veteran or a senior, uh, they are in place. Um, and, and maybe more more effort should be put into more programs like that for, for varying degrees of, of need. Thank you, Renee. The Department of Revenue sets our guidelines that we have to follow. And currently, the level of appraisal that the previous assessor and before her has went with has been on the lowest end of those level of appraisals to keep the Department of Revenue happy and to keep them from coming into our county and setting the property values where they would want them. As far as programs to help property owners with property taxes, I've done some research and I've really not found any programs that are out there but i am still continuing to search for some type of help because i deal with the, the public when i'm out in the field and i talk to the property owners and they are concerned and you know they're worried how they're going to pay their taxes and how we come up with our values are you know we take the replacement costs new, less the depreciation. We apply any market adjustment that is for that neighborhood, depending on how the sales have went. And we take the amenities of the home or the building into consideration, and we put all that into our computer system. And that's how we come up with the values that we base the property taxes off of. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to open um, questions up to the audience. I'm going to one or two questions. Um, I have one other question that was submitted, so I'm going to ask that then, and then we'll move on um, to the attorney candidate. Um, and some of you already touched on this, and we'll maybe give it one minute um, speech. Are there any changes you would make in the operation of the assessor's office? Um, let's start with Renee. Um, there are always room for changes, and we have a really good working group of ladies right now and there's not a lot of room for cross training per se because each person's job duties are so specific and you have to really know what you're doing to go change anything because we don't want to have anything wrong in the computer to where somebody gets charged incorrectly for their property. Um, 
changes. I would like to have more education as far as helping our people understand and be able to converse with the public and explain to them more in depth as to how we come up with what we come up with and what our office does. Thank you. Great. I have quite a few ideas on changes that I'd like to make and if elected. I'd like to definitely improve the website. If you were to go to the website today, you would find six to seven years of property valuation, uh, a little blurb to veterans of when the deadline to sign up for that is, uh, no mention of who might qualify for that or any directions on how to sign up. Um, there's no reason that we can't utilize um, the internet to get more information out to the public about what our office does and to keep them up to date. Um, I would like to incorporate doing community workshops into uh, my schedule if elected. There's no reason that I couldn't go out to communities to, to not only inform them of how their property is valued, but to keep them up to date on um, you know, the schedule. We have a six-year schedule that we have to meet by visiting every property within those years. There's no reason that you shouldn't be informed if you're on, on schedule for a certain year. The change that I'd make would be to do more cross training so everybody's more knowledgeable in what's going on. Not necessarily say that you walk in and tomorrow you're going to do something different in the office, but to where that you will have a duty, but you also know what your fellow co-workers are doing in that office. Um, said I want more awareness out there for veterans. It's just I want to possibly in the future update some of the systems that we have that are in place there um, right now. And I just want to serve part of county to the best of my ability for you people. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming tonight. And if uh, attorney candidates would come up, that'd be good. and why you're, you would be the best person to serve as county attorney. Um, that's if you'd like to go first. Great. And you do have two minutes. Hello. Uh, my name is Seth Johnson. I go by Turtle. Most of you in here know me. The Johnson side of my family has been a part of Harvey County for six generations. My grandfather graduated from Saratoga High School in 1954. I graduated from Saratoga High School in 1999. I care about the people of Carbon County. <laughs> Growing up here intimately, we have become familiar with some of the problems that face the residents of Carbon County, some of the issues that are currently facing the residents of Carbon County. And based on a couple of interactions that I've had, uh, I have decided to run for county attorney because I think that this county is in need of some new leadership and just basically a person that is willing to implement new ideas and new technology to make Carbon County a competitive place, not only for lawyers to practice law, but for businesses to come and to make this their own county, to make sustainable jobs and opportunities for other people here, the citizens. I mean, that's what's important, and that's why I'm here, is I care about you, and I want Carbon County to be a better place for everyone. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ashley Maple Davis. One of the reasons I think I'm qualified for this job is my experience. I've been working in the Carbon County Attorney's Office for the past 10 years. I'm currently the Chief Deputy, which means if Cal Maruca had anything happen, if he's not in the office, I make the decisions. And I carry out the responsibilities of our office. 
I started in the criminal area and worked my way from misdemeanors to felonies, and then I went on to the civil area. So I'm very familiar with the laws that we are responsible to carry out. Um, and I can tell you, the industry is important in Carbon County, but that's not the function of this office. This office is responsible for public safety. The county attorney is the head law enforcement officer for Carbon County. And so that's our job and our function. Um, there begins a question about e-filing. Once again, not a function of our office. That comes down to the Supreme Court filing and the district court clerk's office. So it's important to me that whoever walks into this office can carry out the duties of the office and keep this a safe place. And I am personally committed to keeping the constituents of Carbon County safe and holding people that break the law accountable for breaking the law, to give them a fair and just sentence, but to make sure they think again before they act and will follow the law. That's the job. For me, uh, I'm raising my family in Rollins. That's our home. I have three children. And it's very important to me that they are safe and that our community is safe. And the way you do that is you successfully prosecute cases. And I've done that approximately 3,000 times. That's how many criminal cases I've prosecuted in the course of my career. And that doesn't include, uh, doesn't really cover the last three, the last three years when I've done civil work for the county, representing commissioners, and representing the board and elected officials. So that's why I think it's very important to have an experienced attorney. Okay, thank you. How would you address the drug problem in Carbon County? Ms. Ashley, you were so great. We currently are addressing it through treatment. Um, one of the biggest places we see a drug problem, unfortunately, is our families, because our office, in addition to criminal prosecution, is we do juvenile court prosecution, which means children may be neglected, removed from their home, abused, they may have methamphetamine, drugs in the home, things of that nature. And so one of the things we do in juvenile court is to address that treatment component and look at the whole family and try to unify the family and get resources and services to the family so that they can be successful and have their children back in the home. Uh, through our criminal cases, we do the same thing. If someone has a criminal charge, no matter which route it goes, um, if they're convicted of it, if they're given a deferral under the 35-7-10-37 statute, that's one of the components. It's a requirement to get an evaluation, to seek treatment, and to provide proof that they've done so. And so that's how we address it. Drug addiction is a problem that faces all of Carbon County. It affects everyone in every aspect of life. And we see it directly in the county attorney's office and having to prosecute criminals and in my office having to defend people that use drugs. Drugs are a result of an endemic problem in Carbon County that is a result of a lack of opportunities and a lack of education, which stems from a lack of a competitive infrastructure in a lot of areas. What I would do to treat the drug and use problem is try to afford people counseling options, try to afford them job opportunities, and just make them understand that their choices affect everyone else in Carbon County. And I believe that is the most effective way to treat the drug essential crisis that is facing Carbon County currently. Thank you. What is your philosophy on first-time nonviolent offenders? As has been discussed at many of the forums and at length in the paper article, um, Carbon County currently does not allow its citizens access to 301 diversionary programs, which is a first-time nonviolent offender program, which is a rehabilitation tool put in place by the legislation which allows the offender to take responsibility for their action, serve a term of probation, and then reintegrate back into society. I think that these tools, 301 diversionary tools, are very important tools in treating criminals in Carbon County. There's a distinct difference between 301 diversion and 1037 diversions. 1037s are often used in simple drug offenses. They do not require the consent of the prosecuting office. 301 diversionary programs, which are used for any nonviolent first time offenders, should be available. They require the consent of the office, and those programs are not currently available to the citizens of Carver County. Thank you. That is simply not true. 
And every case is evaluated on a case by case basis. 301s have been given in our office. They are given in cases where they are deemed appropriate. Um, Mr. Johnson has not pulled any cases since we last talked, but 301s have been given while I've been in office for the past 10 years, occasionally for DUIs. Um, sometimes in domestic battery situations. One of the one I gave was in a smaller rural community where a wife and husband got into a fight. The wife uh, found out her husband had impregnated another woman. And uh, she had no criminal history, and it seemed an appropriate sentence in that particular case. But it is not always an appropriate sentence. And if you read the statute, it has nothing to do with the violence of an offense. The things that you cannot get them for are murder. First and second degree sexual assault, first and second degree arson, subsequent DUIs, and subsequent batteries on a household member or assaults on a household member. It really has nothing to do with violence. And the issue often is building a history for someone. Sometimes there's a history that needs to be built. It could be an employee who has that being stolen from their employer, and the next employer needs to know. Child pornography, the possession of it, it may not be deemed as a um, violent offense, it's something under the 301 statute, potentially you could get a 301 for. But wouldn't it be important to know that someone who's looking at child pornography, would you want them working in your schools? Would you want them working around your grandchildren? So just because it's available does not mean it should be given. It's a special circumstance situation. Our job is not to defer crime, it is to deter crime. Mm -hmm. Sure, why don't you take up to 20, 30 seconds? Okay, now, there's a reason why I ran for the county attorney's office. There's a catalyst for everything. I had a specific client that came to me in May that qualified for a 301 diversion. First time offender. Um, she has given me permission to use her case as an example here today. So if you would give me just a second to read the letter that I wrote to the county office and the corresponding response that it is 301s directly and if they're available to you as citizens. This letter is to Cal Peruga. Good morning, sir. I'm writing to you today on behalf of Cheryl St. Moore. I understand you have a general policy against allowing divergence for DUI, and I can see why this is the policy generally. However, Ms. St. Moore is a 63-year-old woman that has a clean criminal history and driving record. The odds of her being a repeat offender at this point in her life are very slim. I'm asking that you consider allowing a diversion for Ms. St. Moore. May I finish? This is important. I, mean, I would use my next response. I'm no, I, I just kind of, I'm sorry. I'm going to allow for a rebuttal. So please, please, please. No, I just, um, we're just going to move on to a different question. I think you both have had a chance, an opportunity to answer the question. Um, and that's really the question that I have. Um, and that's the question that I have. And that's the question that I have. And the next question that was submitted to us, please tell us about your trial experience, particularly jury trials. Seth, if you'd like to go first. Yes. As a new attorney to Carver County, I started practice in 2016. I have limited trial experience. Right now we have several ongoing federal lawsuits and several ongoing trials in the office, but as a relatively new attorney, I do have limited trial experience. Thank you. As a, as an attorney and an experienced prosecutor, I have prosecuted between 30 and 50 criminal trials. Uh, that's being pretty uh, conservative because I don't want to overestimate it, but I've done quite a few uh, since I started downstairs. These are jury trials that I'm talking about where you select a jury. So that uh, done a lot in misdemeanor court and I've done approximately 15 felony cases in district court. Um, some of those have been before local judges, and some of those have been before judges in other places when cases were transferred. But I've had a lot of experience with jury trials. I would say roughly, it's hard to estimate bench trials because those are done very regularly, especially when you're in circuit court, and definitely in the hundreds for doing trials. So I've had a lot of experience both, um, and then also with evidentiary hearings. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? No questions. Okay. Um, what is the
the most effective punishment that you've been given for something that you've done wrong? <laughs> it's always taking something away. And I have kids, and so we use that concept a lot in our house. But, um, you know, I would say definitely having something taken away from me. As a kid, I certainly got into trouble. Um, regularly, I can tell you that I got a speeding ticket one night. My parents told me if I ever got one, I was going to have my car taken away. And so as I was speeding on my way home, because I was late for curfew, I uh, got stopped by a police officer and got a ticket. And so the first thing I did was walk in my parents' bedroom, tell them I'm sorry I'm late, I'm here, the keys are on the table. But that's what taught me. I would say, again, the most effective punishment that I had was uh, community service, right? When I did something wrong, uh, I went in front of the judge and I was made to be held responsible for my actions and then go back and spend time serving the community where I had to be in front of the general public. Um, I had to think about what I did wrong and I didn't understand at the time the service of giving back, the understanding that my, my, my decisions affect everyone else, but that is something that comes as you think about the punishment later on, about thinking, you know, what are people thinking of me while I'm doing this and what led to me being here? I think community service is by far the most effective punishment that I've ever received. Did anyone else think of another question? I have another question. And we'll um, change the last time for one minute. Thank you. Uh, just as a just as a, a participant in the audience and looking, my mind is like, please, can you read that letter so that I know what? It, I mean, it, it's like right in the middle of a of a movie, and then you turn the channel. And could you please read that letter? That's my request. From thank you. She's allowed to do that in the environment. The county attorney's office should be able to give a response. And I think that would be appropriate as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. So, um, do you think you could read that letter within a minute? Oh, yes. Just one minute I'll to go. respond. Great. I will start where I left off, if you don't mind. Paragraph two. So, I'm asking that you consider allowing a diversion for Ms. St. Tamar in criminal case 18 125. The facts of the case warrant me asking is Ms. St. Tamar was not arrested while driving. She parked incorrectly on Main Street, caused no damage to any property was not disorderly, and is willing to plead guilty to the charge of DUI for the sake of getting her probation started. Thank you for taking the time to consider this request on behalf of Ms. St. Moore. Sincerely, Turtle. This is a response verbatim in its entirety. Quote, unquote. That is my policy, period. It is also how the legislature wants the crime charged, period, Cal. If you have been to any of the forums or you've read our articles in the paper, you have heard me mention a general disconnect between the legislative intent of the state of Wyoming and the way that this office enforces the rules. This is a prime example of that disconnect. Thank you. So in preparation for tonight, I actually pulled that file. Pulled all of Mr. Johnson's, all three of his criminal cases that he's had through our office. And the facts of that case are that she was a 0 .20 BAC, so more than two times the legal limit, for alcohol, that she was called in by a complainant who was filling up the air in their tire and was almost struck. The person outside of the car, almost struck by this driver. So, in that factual scenario, no, it's not a case that the county attorney's office thinks it is appropriate for deferral. If you read the entire DUI statute, you'll realize that there's actually a requirement with DUIs that we have to go before the court and request permission in open court to dismiss the case. Because that's how important the legislature thinks prosecution of DUIs is. So to me, you can look at a case and maybe in a case where somebody's a 0.05, maybe a 301 is appropriate. And I'm willing to consider that. But a 0 0.20 almost hitting someone that's standing outside their car is not that case. Okay. Thank you both. Um, and we're going to ask for the sheriff.
education, and everything else. Uh, currently, I'm a Carter County Sheriff. I've been with the department for 28 years. I have experience in not only retention, control, administration, and now I'm a sheriff. Uh, I have a family, my wife, Angie. I've been married with her for 27 years. I have two children, my uh, daughter, Olivia, and my son, Ryan. Currently, right now, the reason that I believe that I am the sheriff and have that ability to be the sheriff is because one, experience, two, I've been with the department, I've seen the changes, I have the experience in all facets of the sheriff's office, and I one of my goals is to continue to be your sheriff, obey <coughs> all the laws, be beneficial to all of the citizens of Carbon County. In addition to my education, like I said, I started out in detention and worked my way up. I worked in an old facility, a new facility, and dealing with other individuals, such as other agencies, have good cooperation with the sheriff's office, with other offices within the, within the county, in addition to uh, working with county attorneys. And my beliefs uh, are strong. I, uh, I really want to provide the best law enforcement that I can to my ability to every citizen in Carter County. So those are some of the things that I, I know. In addition, I've been able to work with budgets, and so that has been very beneficial for me, working along with the county attorney's office and uh, commissioners. Thank you. Okay, we'll just move down the line. Mr. Sorkin? Yeah. Got no time right here. I'm Walter Hagen, and um, I am actually a resident of Wyoming. Oh, sorry, I'm going to point out. I'm a resident of Wyoming for 27 years. I came here in 1982, and I went to Barrow Oil, I showed horses, met my wife, Jeanette, who's been married for 35 years. We have two children and three grandchildren. And uh, from there, I have 27 years of law court experience. I started in Federal uh, for two years. In 15 years, I went to the Rawls Police Department, and then uh, 10 years at the Carbon County Sheriff's Office. I retired in 2015 and started my own business. When I did leave the Rawls Police Department and the Sheriff's Office, I did leave as the rank of sergeant. One thing I'll go back on the uh, Sheriff's Office is what I really like about it is. In the city, you were you had the city limits, so you only did stuff there. But in the county, you did everything. So I had wide experience of doing just like that's the traffic all the way to uh, aggravated assault to major crimes that are mentioned in the city. And that's what that's what's really good about the county being out there. My experience is that I've, I've been involved with so much and. I truly like high visibility. I like being out there. I like deputies to be out there. Um, and we talked about that before, so I'm almost done. But I got some brochures of people uh, over there on the table. I like to look at them. I want to mention something. Uh, we haven't ever discussed it, but I want to give the kudos to the patrol deputies. And to some of you guys hardly ever mentioned is the Carver County Jail detention officers, uh, dispatchers, admin, because what you don't see, what you see the deputies, what you don't see in there is the stuff they have on you. And I have worked with them. Uh, you don't have to be a jailer, but when you're there, you so I want to give kudos to them, just in case they may miss my last one. 
Good evening, Tom Gamble, um, running for Kirk County Sheriff. Married 37 years, seven children, and multiple children after that that we have um, helped to raise. Um, two, we've raised all the way to adulthood. Uh, this is not my only department. Um, in fact, the matter is, if elected, this will be I will be my fifth department. Um, I've worked for um, in another state for three departments, and presently working for Ball State Department 13 years, and Jim Reyes my 14th year. Um, I've been blessed to be here in this state. I wasn't I wasn't raised here, wasn't born here. I was raised in another state, in other states. Been all over Europe. I I speak Spanish, Italian, a little bit of German. Um, I've lived all over the world, and so my only experience is in Carbon County. And that's, I think, is one of the things I'm bringing to the table, is that this is not my only experience. This is not my only department. Well, I don't do things one way. I plan on changing things. That's what I'm doing, and that's what I'm running for. I've been with the Rawls Police Department for many years, and I've seen a lot of things that need changing, and that is my intent, to change some of the things and the way the practices, the way that law enforcement is done, in Carbon County. That is my passion to do so. Um, my wife and I are involved in foster care. We've raised many children in it. Um, we are presently in foster care. So the drug problems that we discussed earlier, our county has a huge drug problem. We see it firsthand through the children that we have in our homes. And it is, it is one of the things we are going to attack in our county. And it starts at the county line, where, where our county deputies work. And we are going to start there, and work it all the way in to our towns and our cities where they will take over from what we're doing. Not that we can't help, but they're fully capable. Rollins Police Department is capable. We've, I've gotten a lot of dope off the street myself. I've caught a lot of people doing a lot of crimes. And all of the crimes that you just discussed, we have in Rollins. From homicides all the way to drug abuse, sex abuse, domestic violence, it's part of the drug problem. Thank you. Title 15 of the Wyoming statutes regarding the operation of cities and towns provides for them to establish and regulate a police department, pass ordinances relating to the department, and adopt job descriptions for all department personnel. For those municipalities who are not providing law enforcement for their <coughs> how would you offer a hand up rather than a handout for those requesting the sheriff's department assistance? Um, Tom, please go first. Well, folks, one of the things that I think that we have is we have, like uh, Walter Hagen said, we have a lot of good deputies. We have a lot of different um, avenues in these departments. Search and rescue is one of them. Um, they're, they're poorly funded. It's something that we're planning on fixing. Search and rescue needs help. It needs to have a bigger budget. They need to have, they need to have some, some props. One of the things I plan on doing is doing that. We need to, we need, somebody said something about mandatory relocation with officers. That is not what we're planning. That's not what we discussed in our last forum. We're not mandatorily moving anybody. But what we plan on doing is scheduling, moving people out, working with the towns, cooperating with them, bringing officers in with them to work scheduling so that the officers that they have in their towns, if they have, if they have, we have two in Hannah, they work days. We bring in guys, start a night shift. Crime is afoot under the cloak of darkness. We don't have anybody at night in the counties except for the patrol officers that are that tend to work those that or get called out with response times in the outer line areas of two hours. We're going to fix that by rescheduling. We're having officers work night time. We don't have a night schedule. It's something that needs to be done. Cooperating with those cities and towns to work together with them to put officers out there to make sure that that the coverage is there for our small towns and working with them, cooperating with those towns and coming up with a plan. Something that we, why we haven't done so far, I have no idea. But to work together with them and get some coverage and get some law enforcement out there. Am I out of time? No. So, so we want to cooperate with the towns. Handshake with them. They're willing to give officers to us. They're willing to help us out, get officers there. Not, not mandatorily move people from their homes and make them live in places that they don't plan on living. Working schedules out there with the towns that are there, working out with officers that are presently working and overworked. I mean, some of them, that's been their complaint. Um, they've been overworked. They, they yeah. are tired. Thank you. Uh, this seems to be a, a 
every report we've had we've discussed. And Tom bragged about a lot of the things. Uh, the difference is, is that, yes, you just can't go in and change them. Um, if I get in, I want to visit with the patrol and do an assessment. We want to, to make sure that we have coverage. And we're not talking about coverage of the towns that don't have uh, law enforcement. Those will have them. But we're also talking about the outline area, the counties, that the whole area. So there needs to be control. Um, eventually, what we can do is, is once we can have a new hire, then that new hire we know that they're going to go to Minnesota, uh, in that area, Elk Mountain, wherever they want to live, so we can have a permanent deputy. In the meantime, at least we can transfer or we'll have the deputies patrol this area, and not every night. I mean, it'd be nice if they could, but it's not realistic because there's other cases these guys are working. But on weekends or if they're really busy, holidays, um, yes, we need to make sure they're out of patrol. So it does go back to manpower. And unfortunately, I see 10 years there, I see where we've been good, lots of people, and times we get them. And when you get a major case, it just takes everything you have. You just don't have manpower sometimes. And, and I know RT is trying to get more people. And that's a great thing. The more manpower, the better. Because the bottom line, even for the commissioner, is the protection of the citizens of this county. And sometimes we have to look at money somewhere else to make sure we have that. So patrolling, and, and that's something from the county, from the towns too. What are they willing to do? And I've already talked to you. Some are willing to give concessions to get ethics out. So it's kind of neat. It's something we can look at. But the bottom line is, yes, doing what we can for the protection of all citizens, not in just the little towns that don't have law enforcement, but to the whole county. And, okay, thank you. Okay. Here's, here's my perception on this. There's a lot of, we have 8,800 square miles in this, in this county. So we have 10 towns within that county. And it is very difficult for our agency to cover everyone at all times. Now, you know, we have more than just um, the big county to consider. A lot of the things that we do in the smaller communities is we try and make a big presence. Just because you don't see us doesn't mean that we're not there. We try and be as much visible as we can. We try and assist in all the other agencies. For example, like these are the two gentlemen we're talking about, Hannah. You know, there are two officers in Hannah. As the sheriff, I'm able to contact those individuals in those cities and say, you know what, let's do some cooperative law enforcement. Let's get some ideas. Right now, we're going creative scheduling until we can get all of our people out and putting them in a location where um, they may not want to be um, or if uh, it's hard for me to pull a family out of a location and put them into another location. So we are doing creative scheduling. We are having everyone covered as much as we can. But you as people need to realize what we're doing. We have a big county. We take care of penitentiary cases that out there we have courts to cover so we're also covering courts and a lot of times we'll have two courts one on one time so that takes two officers but as far as investigations go we're doing everything from homicide to, to uh, a large case so with having these other agencies within our county we need to all work together get together make a plan Get as much law enforcement as we can. What is your law enforcement style and how would you operate the sheriff's department? Walter, you go first. My style is very simple. I like being involved. And what I mean by that is I like being out of the county. I like uh, dealing with people and I also like to the people I work with, uh, just don't want to get the with us. We work very well together because I listened to them. When we did cases, um, the main thing was I had the most experience, but I always asked the people below me, what else do you think we can do? 
And so my style is, I, I, I'm not sitting there saying, I'm in charge of this house going to be. I had a team that was like that, did not like it. And so my style is, if you do a case, I might come to you and say, tell me about your case. It's, it's very interesting and helpful. And actually for the people who are out there working, that they know that I appreciate what they're doing, but if I can say, okay, well, what about this? Because the bottom line of these cases of dealing with people is the victim. Making sure the victim has, has everything, that we've done everything we can for the victim. And the other thing is that working with, uh, pardon me, my mind to dry fit. But working with the, the jail, I didn't work in the jail, but I've been there many, many times. I've brought people in. I've been in the back. So you, you get an understanding of what it's like. If you're around something, then you know what these people are like. And they're hardworking. They bring in prisoners in. And what's my thing? You work with them and not against them. And the same thing is, is when you're, if you're in charge, the main thing is you have to listen to these people. And they got good ideas. I've heard good ideas. Um, no, I'm not it was in a position to go forward with these ideas, but there are some good ideas that patrol and dispatch and and uh, in the jail they have these great ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as far as my style goes, what I did when I you know, took over from Jeremy Nichols. What I did is I actually did a survey of my staff and I tried to determine what areas they felt that they needed or that we as a whole needed to work on. So with that survey, I got the information. I told um, my command staff, this is where we're at. I went up, we had a meeting, and I gave them all of the uh, survey information. I said, okay, this is where we're at, this is what we need to do, and let's go forward. What I did too was I also had the command staff say, you know what, we're going to need everybody's uh, effort in this cooperation of this office. So I do come on a lot of my staff, great staff. They're confident, I'm confident in their abilities. We have individuals that have a lot more um, experience in some areas. And so what I did with that survey was, it's not the only survey that we're going to do. We're going to continue to do that and see exactly where we're at and where we're going and listen to my staff in order to provide the best performance for you guys as citizens. Thank you. As a former business owner and, and operator, my dad the same way offered his, his own his own company. He always told me, he said, one of the things you want to do is train the people under you. Training folks, we need to train people. Community policing is about training, increasing training, helping people to not just use what what they're good at now, but make them better. Training. Uh, and that, that's the key. If you want a better department, you want better coverage, you want community policing, you train your officers to take over those duties so that, and you leave it with them. Use them as resources because let's face it, for you and I, each one of those deputies that work today, each one of the officers that work in your city, each one of the officers that work in Rollins are resources, but they have to be trained because when you start as a police officer, what do we do? First thing you do, you train them. Because not everybody knows how to be a deputy or a police officer. It's hard work. Policing is changing every day. In my career, I have watched policing change immensely. It's a different, it is a different ballgame altogether. And the way you have to do that to meet the needs of your community, you folks, should get behind me and say, yes, we need training. Policing is changing. It's moving. It's ever growing, and we want to grow with it, and we have to grow with it, otherwise we're left behind. I mean, that's one of the ways we do it, is by training the officers to, to take my place, to take the, the understudies place for me. Um, I have officers under me. I know what it is to, to staff people, to be their boss, 
I know how that is. And so use their resources. Don't get involved. Let them have it. Let them, and sometimes they have to slip and fall. They have to fail. Part of the training is slipping and falling, saying, okay, that's not the way to do it. Let's change it around. And that's close to where I'm headed. Let's change some things around. We've done things in the, in the county for many years the same way. And we need to change some of those things and add training. Are there any audience questions? Yes, Mr. There are a couple out there, so I'll try to. We also have a few Facebook pages. Okay. Questions too, Kevin. If there's so many questions, let's um, change the response time to one minute. We will get a couple more in. Thank you. Uh, my name is Byron Walters. Um, I just had a question about, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about your uh, position and, and uh, what your stance is. How about um, standing for the deputy? Say we have um, a shooting or, you know, an officer involved shooting or, or uh, something that an emergency issue. Uh, just was curious um, what your position is with um, thank you for your Thank you. Archie, please go first. As far as a critical incident like that, I would stay pretty neutral. There is a, uh, a certain, uh, yes, policy and procedure that we would follow. Uh, what I would do is I would call another agency in to investigate that particular incident. I'd be in contact with the county attorney's office, making sure that um, they're up to date and we're working with them. And as far as standing behind the deputies, that's the main question. I would stand behind my deputies 100%. In effect, they may utilize and we would need to have training records and what, whatever they need to do that. But not only that, I think what I would do is, um, in addition, help them Okay, because they're going to be the ones that are actually involved in this shoot, and they're going to need some help. So I'm going to provide that family with what I can provide legally. Uh, this is very simple to me. Um, like I said, I went from the Rawls Police Department and to the county. I've been on both sides of this, and and I know what it's like not to have the administration back you up when you know you're right, and when you prove you're right, then they then they're all that's in glory for you. Um, my stand is when I work with my people, I was there for them all the time, no matter what it was, and if there's a critical situation, I told them, I said the first thing is to make sure, which I did. Uh, make sure you have an attorney that you can call, especially in a critical incident situation, because the administration wants to come in and say, okay, what did you do? Fortunately, legislation that was passed that you can't talk to that officer for 24 hours because they're in a bad situation, and they might say something that, they didn't, that didn't happen. But bottom line, you've got to watch for the officer because, yeah, that's not enough time. There are mandates, uh, statute guidelines that you have to follow the, the 24 hours. You can't contact them, you can't speak with them. But outside of that, you know, and, and as an officer recently going through um, a number of different things and seeing other officers, guys that work for me in my shift, um, transparency, folks, because the problem, you know, we talk about technology, adding technology to the to the Carbon County Sheriff's Department. Um, I believe I'm the only guy out here who's presently using it. Not, not a negative. I'm just saying this this thing right here in the social medias. I mean, will tear up a, a, a critical incident because everybody has their perception of how that incident took place. The departments have to be transparent. You have to have you have to have somebody to address the social media because everybody takes their own spin on it, and then somebody else takes a spin on that, and they spin it completely out of control. After the after the a lot of time, you've got to take that you got to take that subject in. You got to let it know we are here for you, and you have to address it on the department side because the things that they're facing on the social side, the social media side, and what social media does to them, and the questions that they begin to ask themselves, 
you have to take them in. So it's all about addressing the social media too and bringing them in. Thank you. Maybe a last question. Yeah. Um, Jeff, you I have kind of a three-part question. Um, how many, with all these little outlying towns and Kevin, uh Hannah, Banks, how many, and Saratoga, how many of these, how many of these small town police forces have a deputy sheriff's badge in their pocket so that they could go immediately out of town when called and become a deputy sheriff on the job? ready to go right then. I don't know if the legal part. Second part of the question. How many of these towns are willing to put up some money? I've, I've lived places in the past where the town bought the car and the, and the county ran the car and they worked out to get more support in there. Third part of the question. How many of these is there a deputy sheriff living in Medicine Bow and down in the little state and in encampment. I don't know these things. How are we handling these manpower things, which I believe it all comes back to manpower. Okay, so that's a lot to touch on in one minute, but if you'd like to give it a shot, Tom, huh? that's great. That's a lot to answer, but let me just put it this way. Do I think that the, that the sheriff today is trying to do that? Absolutely. I mean, we've made, it, this has been an issue in every form. Because why? Because we don't have officers. There is no officer in medicine boat. Response times, that's one of the reasons I bring up that, because they don't have representation. Response times are an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes even higher. That's rare, be higher than that, but response times for a 911 call should not be an hour and a half, two hours. But, and, I, and I believe that, that the sheriff is trying to work on that. But you're right, how many people do we have with that in their pockets? There are none out there in that area, none. Um, do they have officers available? Yeah, they have to respond from other areas. And I think that's what they're trying to work on, trying to get that done. Reserve officers. Well, there's a new idea. Think outside the box, right? The towns are willing to throw money at the, at the sheriff's department, whatever they can, to come up with a, um, an MOA, a method of understanding, or MOU, and work with the Carbon Tech Sheriff's Department. I know that they have that, and that's what they're trying to do as well. Roger. Okay, well, the first part, uh, actually, they don't need badges. Uh, under the mutual aid pack, if, uh, if it's epidemic, it's called a Rollins, and there's nobody out there, say domestic and medicine bowl, to help them out, and let's say help medicine bowl, because they can call Hannah and say it's really something going bad, and, and under mutual aid, request that they go out. At that point, they become a deputy. They're covered by the county, that's has to change. Um, on, on the towns themselves, then yeah, you gotta approach a town and say, what can you get? Because a deputy doesn't have to live, per se, in the town. Uh, they can live close proximity. So you can't say right in the town. And I do this with Tom on response time. Because I have responded to that support for moments. And you can get there 35 minutes if, if the weather's good. If the weather's not good, yeah, it changes. But I've got to, and that's not a good thing when your, your truck's maxed out. Okay, everybody get your last question. Okay, first part of your question is, I have uh, a deputy not in here and not in medicine boat, but I do have one in Elk Mountain. Um, that individual was hurt, he was on duty, now he's back. So what we're doing in that department is that we do have one in Elk Mountain. Um, as far as the towns, like these two individuals said, um, the other officers don't have a badge in their pocket. Utilize the mutual uh, aid, and I believe it's statute 72603. And basically, what that is is being the chief law enforcement officer, I can contact Game and Fish, I can contact High Patrol, I can contact these other individuals, and have them respond to those locations. Um, the the money. Um, commissioners right now, we're working on different things in order to get funding for these communities. I believe with the town of Medicine Bow, I wrote a letter to their town um, in support of them getting a uh, police officer for certain things. Um, I've given them information to 
be provided to them and where they can look for a law enforcement officer, how they can do it, what the other small communities are doing. I'll turn the mic over to Josh and he can read the Facebook questions. There's three of them, Kathy. Okay. 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 So the first Facebook question comes from Patrick Patterson. What is your plan to modernize both the jail and patrol, including introducing new technology to the force? Actually, on the jail, I don't know much about it. With that I do know uh, when I was there three and a half years or three years four months that we did have a problem with the camera system when you bring somebody in, and that really does need to be upgraded. It was a pain, work half the time and stuff. I it still works, but trying to get stuff done. Um, and it took a genius who was a computer person to get it. Concerning patrol, which I was more familiar with, now when I started with, with the county, we had two, two radars. And could not get the administration to purchase radar. Um, deputy, Deputy Craig, was in Cheyenne, and he came back from the surplus with 16 radar units, the ones they have in their trucks now. It didn't cost the county a dime. The only thing that we had to spend money on was uh, the county had to buy uh, cables for $600 and had to be tested. And then everybody went to class. He also came back with, I wouldn't finish this, he came back with cameras for all of the vehicles that were never put in our vehicle. High dollar cameras. Okay, as far as the jail goes, we are in the process right now of updating the cameras for our system. In addition, we're working on a 911 system for the jail and for our whole outfit. Um, right now, as far as the detention officers, in addition to technology, we've purchased body cameras for that, for the safety of the, of the officers. Um, We've been able to establish and get new radios for detention and for patrol. In addition to the detention, what we've also done is been able to utilize a grant, and we've got new vests, stab vests, for all the deputies in the, in the detention. Patrol, we're working on different things right now. We also provided them with uh, body cameras for them also. Um, where these other individual agencies may just have a car camera. We have body cameras. Um, in addition to that, we're also looking at maybe a, a touch tone, I guess it's a touch pad instead of a computer for the program. Why well, I could be working on enforcement every day, and I'll tell you. Um, one of the things that the county needs to do is invest in computers in, in the cars. It's, it's got to be a must. We're in the 21st century. And the, the county needs to catch up because there are programs out there that even the Rawls Department uses that are available through Stillman. And the, I mean, I, I like that he said the grants. We need to get grants and get some computers in there. The less money we can spend, the more we can spend on the training, the more we can spend on the officers and developing the other line areas as well. Technology in the vehicle, not just in the not just in the, the computer system, but the camera system. The jail. The jail needs an update in technology. I go into the jail literally, I, I'm in the jail every week. Not, not as much as some that are sitting here, but um, I'm in the jail every week, just about. And so I see that they, that some of the systems are antiquated. Some of the computer systems, the monitors, I mean, um, as I understand their, some of their equipment, they, they're still using from when the original, when the jail was originally built and those things were placed in. That's not a bad thing, it's working. And then we're trying to save the county money by continuing to keep these things up and updated. So, thank you. That, that is short. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second question comes from Kyle Lancaster. Assess the recent performance of the Sheriff's Department, and if elected, would you keep it on the same direction or change course? Um. <laughs> I think my yard side say it all. New vision, new direction. But we're going to change stuff. We're not going to keep it the same old way it has been for 25, 28, 30 years. We're going to change. And, and listen, I'm not saying that in negative. I'm saying things have to change, is what I'm trying to tell you. 
Um, we can't continue on the same line that they've been on the whole time. Um, the sheriff is, has been with the sheriff's department for a long time. He's been the under sheriff for, I believe, four years. He's been the sheriff for now, what, seven months, one on eight. Um, we're starting to see some changes by that. But four years as an under sheriff, seven months as now, seven months, and all these things are being brought up. We've got to bring some change a whole lot faster than that. It has to be done. Because there are things that we, we can do technology tech, with technology. There are things that the jail has to update that we have, I mean, that's got to be on the forefront of everything we do. And I know we have to work in a budget. I know that we have money issues, and, and I'm aware of that. But we've got to think outside the box. We've got to get these things going on right now. Okay. Yes, there's going to be change. And it's not going to be overnight. You never can change anything overnight. Um, when I was there, like when I went to the sheriff's office, the philosophy was, even before I got there, was we're investigators and that's all we do. We take calls, but we're investigators. I disagree with that. You know, everybody investigates, from the lowest patrolman up to the uh, biggest sheriff. Okay, but the difference is that you have to take a couple of people who are very good investigators and haven't worked in major crime. Nothing worse when you work in major crime, you, need, you have to go take care of a small call or you get called to dispatch or whatever. You cannot. Uh, work on a major crime. And I want to eliminate that. Still, we have the other deputies involved, but yeah, that's part of what I want to do. But yes, technology, I'm a big favor of it. And I've got computers in the cars, the cameras. Like I said, we had, I think we calculated $80,000 in cameras, and they sit in that building at the jail after I left. And so, when you get free stuff, good stuff from high patrol, use it. Okay. I believe the question was assess the sheriff's office right now. As far as that question goes, I believe the sheriff's office is very, very well respected. And as far as assessing it goes, we're looking at technology, we're looking at everything that we need to do. But I want to make that point. People come to the sheriff's office and call the sheriff's office because it's a respected agency. And that's what I want to keep it. We got good people, we got good staff, and we got a lot of good ideas. And the staff is basically what makes your department. You know, we have a lot of individuals there that have some long-term goals, and that's a good thing. We have a lot of young people, and they have new ideas, and they have experiences in different fields. We're going to utilize that. But like I said, as far as the department goes, it's all about the people in it and your staff and your command staff. Now, um, what do I think? I think that this office is going to continue to grow. Thank you. One more. Okay, so final question comes from Amanda Gamblin. What distinguishes you from the other candidates? What distinguishes me from these two other individuals is I have experience. I've done it. I've been in it. I know every facet of the office. So like, for example, if I'm talking about detention, I've been in detention. So I know what that means. I know what those individuals are facing. And I know the problems that they're facing. And I know the achievements. As far as patrol, the same thing. I've been on patrol. I know the getting up in the middle of the night, going out, and that's another thing. Um, being able to, to see where that person is coming from. In addition, administration. The last four years, yes, I was learning from an individual. Um, I've, I've worked for three sheriffs, and I learned a lot from all. Um, the most I've learned from is Sheriff Jerry Colson and Don Schroeder. And so learning from those individuals, I may not always believed in what they were doing, but it also gave me the ability to be here. Well, let's start with detention. Okay. I didn't work in the jail, but you don't have to work in the facility to understand it. Uh, I've been back there, I've visited with people, 
But you have a person, uh, the captain is in charge now, they run it. The sheriff doesn't have to go in there and work. Um, he depends on the people who run these different the patrol and, and the detention. Uh, so there are good people who run these divisions. So yeah, I was in patrol, I know it very well. But I also know the people and how it, how it runs. So have I worked there? No. And young people, I don't want to. I admire the people that work back there. And I probably could because the first one to spit on me, well, I'll probably fly. So, uh, but that's me. When it comes to admin, okay, have, have I seen the budget? Can I work the budget? Everybody's going to run the budget. Okay, your budget is small, my business budget is small. The county budget for the sheriff is about 3.4 million. Right? But it's set out. It's not something you have to start from zero. Okay. I tell you, you get a little you get a little frustrated up here. And I just you get a little frustrated up here because there's just not enough time to explain some of the things that are going to have I ever run into you? No. But have I made plans for that? You bet. I can tell you right now that I, I have already spoken to two candidates. One of those one of those candidates has already accepted to be the other chair. Um, I'm making plans for the future. I'm, I'm already ahead of that ball game. The person that I the people I have spoken to, the one that has agreed to work with us, is well respected in, in the, the county. He, he has worked with the jail before. He he knows how to run the jail. He has actually been and he's been an admin himself. And my plan is to utilize the people, the great workers that this county already has, the deputies that are already there, the jail that's already there, the dispatchers, they know what they're doing, they're trained. Let them go, let them do their job. Patrol, let's attack the drug trafficking, the drug problem we have, back to what we need to do. How are you gonna do that? Let your officers do what they're supposed to do. Let them get out there and do the trafficking. What separates me? I plan on not just working in an office, I plan on getting in my vehicle, Again, it's your, well, you know, I got more to dislike you right now. <laughs> 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 um, I, 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 that was the last question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I know there's some additional questions from other hands raised, but if you want to stick around after the forum, um, maybe the individuals. I really think I should have a right to say something because I'm messing up. And if there's any community that could run around this whole thing, it's mine. And I have a question for these men. Uh, Mrs. Coleman, I think we've covered this pretty thoroughly, so I agree. This is going to get down to thirty-second question and That's thirty-second answer. It'll be a thirty-second. <laughs> All right. I like I said, I'm from Mexico. And how are you guys going to help us? We're trying to put in a cop force to help you. But in the same sense, we need direction. And I've been directed, you know there's a criminal influence in my town. How do you want to give it up? So I'd like to mention you have 30 seconds this time. Talk um, fast. Yes, I'll talk fast. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to talk about my watch, so Walter, please go first. Oh, yeah, go fast. Uh, best thing to do is, is get deputies in that area and control it. The other thing is, as a citizen, and you guys are concerned, you need to let the deputies know or you need to call it in. We can't see everything. You know, I've driven through town before and I've heard there's crimes, but if you don't, as a citizen, uh, come out and say, okay, like neighborhood one, here is what we're going to do. Let's call these people. The law enforcement, then if they have an idea of something going on, can start surveilling that area. So it really goes back to you guys too. Okay. Okay, I'll make this fast. We are trying to do the best we can to the best of our ability, but we don't know it if you don't tell us. And like I said, Ms. Cohen, I've given you uh, options, alternatives, and I haven't heard anything back from you. So you know what? You need to probably be voiced, and we can help out. If we don't know there's a situation, you know, can't fix it. Night shift. Night shift. Get somebody out there at night. You got people working in the daytime. You got to rotate people in and out of there. That's what they're trying to do. Night shift. Crime is a foot under the cloak of darkness. Start patrolling, not just driving through the town. Stop cars. People that are that are driving through. 
Drug problems start outside of our county and come through our county to our to our cities. Let's get deputies out there. Scheduling should have been done a long time ago when they knew all that it was going to be emptied out. Not by everything, but there were officers going to leave. Should have been planned way back then. Deputies during the daytime as best you can and night shift. Thank you, gentlemen. Saratoga and then over to the city of Rollins. 
Retired 28 years after that with the city of Rollins. And I believe what makes me um, qualified, um, I've seen the services, the emergency services, and some of the other ancillary services that the county supports. Um, my parents have unfortunately had to use the senior center a couple times to have some meals delivered to them. They've had to use the ambulance service. Um, the fire department near and dear to my heart, I was a volunteer here. Uh, on the ambulance service, volunteer firemen on the county and in Saratoga. So I've seen those and how those work. I currently work part-time for the uh, Carbon County government in buildings and grounds maintenance. So I've had the opportunity to see the use of the senior centers, the jail, uh, the equipment that is working in the jail, the equipment that isn't working in the jail, I get to work on some of that myself. So I think having the ability to live in Wyoming, grow up in Wyoming. There's five generations of us through this time, and I've seen the government side, I've seen the personal side, I've seen the boom and bust side, I've managed big budgets, I've managed big projects, I've been in the legislature promoting projects, testifying for projects, been to countless meetings on planning and zoning, on county and citywide. I just have an awful lot and I've been around for a while. I've 57 years, so like some of these gray hairs I earned some of them I've got from maybe not doing the exact same thing that I would do if I had that opportunity here. Thank you. My name is Travis Moore. I'm a career educator. I've been in Rollins uh, pretty much my whole life. I've worked for Carver County School District going on 20 years. I fought fire for the federal government for 13. I think the last time I saw Don Sherrod in a fire truck, I hit my lightning down on Rattlesnake Pass Road. So I've got me a little flashback, uh, June or no, July 11, 1994, as a matter of fact. I'm here for the people of Carver County. I want to make sure um, that we're serving the people and we're also helping the people that are helping us, the county employees. In every department, in every walk, in every building, every place, I want to make sure that those people are taken care of, that they have the protections that they need, that the mechanisms and the systems are in place, that they can do their jobs better. You heard a lot about cross training from all the different candidates and all the different stuff. There has to be some resource and some support from the commissioners in addition to help all those people, as well as all the folks that serve on all the different boards in our county. It's a beautiful citizen government model but we have to make sure they have what they need to be successful. And I cannot stop talking before I wish my lovely wife, Jennifer, a happy birthday today. Happy birthday. Good evening, thanks for coming because this is the only way you have a chance to see the difference in the people that you're going to be asked to vote for. My name is Terry Weichman. I moved to Carver County in 1978 with my beautiful bride, and we moved here for two years because it was booming and we're still here. Uh, we love Carver County. We have four children, 11 grandkids. Um, not a lot of them get to live here, but um, the reason I decided to run again for county commissioners, there's a lot of things coming to Carver County. Uh, the, anywhere from wind farms to, to oil and gas to who knows what's next. I take an extensive uh, NEPA training, uh, two weeks of very intense training in Cheyenne to, to learn the NEPA process so that I can talk to the BLM and talk to the Forest Service, know what they're actually saying. They use so many acronyms, it isn't even funny. I've worked with almost every board in Carbon County, so I know what their jobs are. I know what uh, what they're trying to accomplish. I will need some updating. I've been gone for a few years. I've listened to every commissioner meeting and every city council meeting uh, since. I stay involved. Um, I'm interested in, in uh, continuing to watch Carver County grow. Um, with some of the wind farms and some of those things coming, um, it takes a lot of training. I was there, uh, the, the chairman of the wind task force committee for the county commissioners association and we're the people that uh, went to the legislature, worked with the legislature, asking them to set minimum standards and whatnot. So there were some rules because there weren't any rules. They weren't paying sales tax. 
they weren't paying production tax. Um, we got a lot of stuff done. And I think the challenges coming to Carbon County are so special, this two-year term that I'm asking to be appointed to. I think my uh, knowledge, my expertise, my experience, uh, I, I will work very, very hard for Carbon County. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm John Johnson. Um, I know quite a few people in here. Uh, I'm a fifth generation ag producer on my mom's side and my dad's side. We have sixth generation working beside us, and now we have the seventh that are working kind of beside us. But they're having a lot of fun. I've been in Carbon County my whole life. I've been married to my wife for 36 years yesterday. Um, got the news that we're going to be grandparents again, too, so that's really cool. When I look at what went on in the last three forums and, and what's going on, it it solidifies one of the reasons I'm going to go in there. Carbon County is going to need the leadership to, to help guide whoever's in the office, to help understand the budget. When we first were seated new commissioners nearly six years ago, um, we come in dire times, hard times. We learned to work with all the department heads, elected officials as a team, create a balanced approach, a fair approach, where we brought Peter to pay Paul to put more in. Um, that's happened. I, I don't I, I don't see where we could have done anything else because the dollars were gone. But I think the experience I've had in these last six years under the circumstances that we've had certainly is going to be needed and as we move forward in Carbon County. Good evening. My name is Bob Davis. I'm from the Snake River Valley, just on the other side of the hill. I've been married to my bride for 40 years, and we have a bunch of grandkids and children, and they all live on the ranch. But that's not all they do. Uh, our background, we are currently involved in three different businesses, all of three which are the number one, two, three of Carbon County. We're in the energy business, we work in the oil and gas fields out there. So we've got about 30 years of experience in there. We're also into the restaurant, hotel, and bar industry. We've got a lot of experience in there. That's the number two, tourism in Carbon County. We know what it takes to draw people into your establishment to get that cash flow coming to you. And then lastly, probably the most impressive one, is the ranching industry. It uh, by far is the most complicated of all the the businesses that my wife and I are in. Uh, you, uh, you just never know. You're the cheapest labor there. You're the mechanic. You're the problem solver. You're the financial wizard. I think with my background in these industries, I can bring a good insight to the commission and help make good, positive decisions for Carbon County and the people of Carbon County. And I would appreciate a vote. Thank you. Thank you. There has been some discussion about affordable housing programs in Carbon County in order to meet the needs of the workforce that precedes our economy, especially in areas where the cost of real estate is rising. Please explain what affordable housing models are appropriate for Carbon County and what do you think have and have not worked in other <coughs> counties and municipalities. We'll start down on this end with Bob. Let's work our way down the table. Sure. There, there has been some discussion about affordable housing programs in Carbon County in order to meet the needs of the workforce to set the state our economy, especially in areas where the cost of real estate is rising. Please explain what affordable housing models are appropriate for Carbon County and what you think have and have not worked in other Wyoming counties and municipalities. This is a, been a much debated question. I served a little time on the Carbon County Economic Development Board and they've researched this and worked on this problem over and over again. Uh, affordable housing is dependent upon the labor that is coming in. We have short-term labor in our county, such as the, the turnover at St. Clair when they're doing a turnaround up there. Okay, we have long-term economy or housing needs. And those are for the permanent jobs that are left behind from the boom and bus cycle. 
Um, you know, it's been, been discussed up there, and there doesn't seem to be a one-size-fits-all solution to this. We went to, and even been discussed with this upcoming wind energy, mad camps and things like that, how they could play in, because we're limited to the amount of housing in Carver County. So it depends on which area you're addressing in this, whether it be the short term or the long term, as to what housing we do have available in Carver County. It is, it is a problem, uh, not an easy solution. Um, everybody likes to have an affordable house, and that, that's great. And that, that starts with a good paying job. We need to create a diverse economy to help them get a job that they can afford these houses. Um, the short term is, is probably the most dire in my mind um, with all the construction and wind energy coming in. It's, it's going to be a housing impact like, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be hard for any place, but to find a place to live. Commissioner Davis touched on man camps. That might be a, a, an issue or, or an idea that we have to pursue and pursue probably through the Industrial Siting Council and make them require that as part of their permit. Um, yeah. <laughs> Housing in Carver County it, it varies depending on what community I happen to live in Rollins. And, uh, you can either uh, uh, rent 400 places or buy 400 houses that are on the market or you can't rent a place. And it, it is a tough deal because people do come and go. There is a short term and a long term um, situation, but it's aggravated by things like the correctional officers at the penitentiary cannot afford uh, their own house a lot of times. I think that uh, working with the, with the penitentiary, working with the, uh, St. Clair and some of the other large employers that have a hard time getting help because they cannot get housing, I think working with those people to hook them up with uh, developers that uh, will build reasonable kind of, not cookie cutter, but reasonable apartments. I've noticed that every time in Rollins that uh, the boom goes away, the apartments are full, the houses are not necessarily. Um, if there was some assurance by these larger companies that these apartments would be rented, then developers would take that chance. But with the economy going up and down so so uh, severe in, in our community, it, it does make a tough thing. I don't like man camps, but when you have people that are here for a few months and they're not going to stay here at the end of it, for sure you don't want a bunch of empty houses. So I think we have to rely on on some of those temporary housing situations. Kind of got lost on that a little bit. Did you run it back one time? Sure. There has been some discussion about affordable housing programs in Carter County in order to meet the needs of the workforce that sustains our economy, especially in areas where the cost of real estate is rising. Please explain what affordable housing models are appropriate for Carbon County and what do you think has and has not worked in Wyoming, in other Wyoming counties and municipalities? I think Jerry was on something with affordable apartment type housing. Um, the, the biggest question is it's a one time expenditure and who's going to take care of it after? Uh, in my experience, I remember people living in tents um, during the first boom when I was just a wee willy, and they lived in tents and the trailer parks built up. And then after the fact, when people came to stay, they built housing developments, which mm -hmm. now have been bought up and the rental prices are, are pretty high. I think that's where a lot of that's coming from. Um, we reach capacity. One thing we can do is work with state officials, as he said, as others have said. We need to work with private industry to do that kind of stuff. If we're going to bring the workforce in for their company, they need to put some of the bill, and we need to talk to the legislature about some of those folks staying in their motels that hurts our tourism, that after a certain stint in a motel, they no longer pay lodging tax. So that goes, it doesn't go to the state, doesn't go to anybody, it's just in their pocket, and that's hotel rooms that tourists can't stay in. So that's something else we need to work on. Well, we tried that in Rollins when I was over there. Uh, the city put in two houses, two modular houses. There was some low income funding that came through HUD and a couple of other places, and it didn't take us very long to figure out. We weren't landlords, um, and it didn't take us very long 
to figure out that we weren't land developers either. We had a big project that was scheduled to go with some private developers out by the baseball fields. Um, the city owned the land. The city was going to do a agreement with them over a period of time, dependent on the size, and allow them to keep building in different stages, single family, multi-family. The infrastructure costs, the developers that were doing that, somebody has to make money. The developer's going to make money, or we're going to pay taxes to help subsidize that. That's what we found out, that it's, it's real tough. And somebody's got to come up with a checkbook, and I'm not sure that we want to do the taxes and try to be developers and landlords. Ms. Sharp, do you mind giving me a 30 second? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> some of you may know that I'm also a real estate agent and a real estate broker. I opened my own office a couple months ago. Uh, what got me started on that was uh, I was actually a multi family uh, property investor in New Orleans. Um, my wife and I, over a period of seven years, built uh, up to 20 units. And uh, so we saw a lot of the boom and bust. There's three things that I want to talk about. Um, one is, is that I believe the city of Rollins um, should consider uh, annexing some ground that uh, private developers could come in and build um, apartment complexes that are affordable. Uh, as a landlord, one of the things I heard um, was that there wasn't any affordable um, properties or, or rentals or homes in Rollins. And uh, I will admit that I took advantage of that, um, but I was always fair with that because I wanted to be able to live in the homes and the apartments that we own. Um, <clears throat> the third thing is is that um, Carbon County is really interesting because uh, Circo has a lot of uh, uh, tourism and outside money um, and so it kind of um, inflates property values which makes it difficult for people um, that work at the refineries and, and uh, those areas to afford homes. And so um, I believe that we need um, some more subdivisions uh, around uh, Saratoga and the Cameron area. Thank you. And um, my, my uh, perception with both Mesco and Hannah has been um, because homes are, are very affordable in both of those places um, is just the distance and the drive. Um, so a lot of people are naturally drawn to uh, Saratoga and the Platte Valley. Uh, so my experience is, and my suggestion is, is that maybe uh, we should consider uh, approaching the city of Rollins about um, expanding the, uh, the city border. Thank you. Rollins is not a huge source of tax dollars after initial construction, nor do they offer many long-term jobs after construction. Do you think they contribute enough to the local government to offset their impact? We'll start with Terry. Never enough. No matter what they give, I don't think it's enough. They should give more. But the fact of the matter is, is people felt the same way about gas and oil. When the train, when the railroad came through, uh, oh my God, we're tearing up all this land. How are you going to? Uh, gas and oil was the same way. How do you charge for it? Where do you? Where do you? charge for the gas at at the pump or in the line or wherever. With wind energy, it isn't really like, Mr. Commissioner, do you want yes or no wind energy? It doesn't work that way. All of your life begins with a paycheck, and if you ask the people that work at the wind energy, they love it. The, some of the other people don't really care for it. It is, it is a compromise. There are places that uh, wind energy can be that doesn't disrupt anybody's life or hunting habits and such like that. I will tell you that um, it's like standing in front of a train. You can stand at the, in front of the train or you can stand at the switch. And I always have chosen to stand at the switch. It's coming. It's on private property. They have that right. You can't stop a lot of it. Um, would you want to stop it? If you could, it is industry. And, and so therefore, I always made it my goal to since it was coming in, you couldn't stop it. Let's get the most out of it for Carbon County that we can possibly get. Um, I, whether you like it or you don't like it, it is an industry. And, 
And we in Wyoming can't say we want diversity as long as it's gas and oil. <laughs> this is wind energy and then the, the impact after is not very much for economics, is that it? Right. Do you think they contribute enough to the local government to offset their impact? This is one of those situations, and I mean, and I've told this story to a lot of people. But we're in the same situation as the as the scooter wagon company. Uh, we need to figure out if we're in the wagon building business or if we're in the transportation business. And I think Wyoming, for the long haul, is an energy state. We provide a great deal of energy for a lot of other places. And the fact of the matter is, private industry will come and try to exploit us for those things as long as it's here. And we need to make a stand for those things. We need to develop industry that supports those types of things and, and other things that go with it. If we embrace the fact that we're an energy state, not just fossil fuel, but an energy state, we can get solar driven data centers and things like that sprinkled across the railroad or, or right down the I-80 corridor and those types of things run completely on solar, which I believe is in the top 10 in the world for sunlight. Um, with those types of things, we have to be at the forefront bargaining for ourselves collectively, or they're just going to come and do it anyway and send the money somewhere else. Great. So the wind energy issue, um, over in the Elk Mountain portion of it, the people that I've talked to, um, everybody likes the income that comes in from it, but nobody wants to sit there and look at it. I was one of the guys that, when there was 10 of them out at Arlington and would drive from Rollins to Cheyenne, it was kind of a novelty. And now there's probably a thousand of them between Arlington and Casper if you drive that way and back through County Road 402. They're all over the place. And with that comes the transmission lines. Um, it's, it's not a Dwayne Stalins County Commissioner question, it's uh, the 15,000 people that live in Carbon County that affects each and every one of us differently. Um, it does make an impact. It makes an impact on the tourism as well. It makes an impact on the hunting. Uh, private landowners, uh, you know, they do have the right to do some developing, but I would hope that we would encourage people to do it so we don't destroy the wide open spaces that we have within Carver County and work together with people and try to convince big investors that may or may not even know where Carbon County, Wyoming is until somebody said, let's put a windmill up that the wind blows at Arlington all the time. Um, those are the individuals we need to do. And I know we do that. I've been in the planning commission meetings and I know all these gentlemen up here have done the same thing, so. Okay. May I have my third thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> So we're talking about community and we're talking about diversifying. Um, and, and going back to one of the questions that we talked about with housing, um, if Carbon County has been a boom and bust cycle, how do we break that cycle? That cycle is with diversification. So we have to be open-minded to uh, the wind energy. We have to be open-minded to those things. The question was, um, are they paying enough um, of the wind? energy projects that have been approved uh, in my tenure on the Planning and Zoning Commission at this current 6% tax rate, there'll be close to $30 million in sales tax generated on just those turbines alone, and that doesn't include the Joe Cherry Sierra Monitor project. With that said, there's also money coming in, uh, as has been said on private uh, ground, as these leases have been made. I don't know uh, what those numbers are because typically they're confidential, um, but I do know and has been shared with me that there are several companies that are paying four to five thousand dollars per year per tower. So take a family that maybe owns some land and has 150 towers and five thousand dollars, that's what, 750,000. Uh, that money goes back into Carver County. Those families spend that money here. Those families work here. So uh, I don't know if we can put a number on whether they're paying enough, whether they're paying their part, um, but because of people like uh, uh, Candidate Wycombe and those that have walked before us on the 
uh, planning and zoning board and the county commissioners of getting in front of the train. Thank you. Uh, they were able to put the foresight in to charge the sales tax and to take care of those things. So um, I'm thankful for that and uh, I look forward to, to working hard in their footsteps uh, to try to keep uh, ahead of the game. Thank you. Okay, uh, when in general, you know, we're going to have the construction jobs. That's going to be the boom to the to the whole thing, to Carbon County. We'll have all the people coming in. We'll get the sales tax revenue, all those things. But that's the short term. The long term of this is there will be some permanent jobs, some higher paying jobs for more affordable housing. And also with that, we will develop some of the necessary um, service companies that go along with these. So there is going to be some uh, basic permanent development as long as these wind towers are in, in use. The, other, the, the bigger, broader vision of this is that transmission line. It's like the natural gas pipelines. It's like the railroad. Out of Carbon County. That gives us a place that if wind does not pan out per se, that we have the ability to use our natural gas through natural gas generation of electricity. I mean, those, those are some longer vision books out there. Um, like I say, it will help the assessors out a little bit. It will give them another little twitch in there to work on there with all these new wind towers and things. But I think overall, this is what we've got going for Carbon County right now. This is the cards that are dealt to us. We, as, as the citizens of Carbon County, need to do the best to, to take advantage the best we can of it. Thank you. Um, the total wind capacity in Carbon County today uh, generates nearly $500,000 to the county in, in revenues. That's a lot of money. I'm not dismissing $500,000, but that's just a drop in the bucket. That's not that much. We try to have to pay for services and patrolling and everything out in the county. There are benefits, as Mr. Barker said, to the private landowner that gets uh, fortune or misfortune or whatever, but chooses to put the wind farm on his place. And those dollars do go back into the county in one shape or form. The other longer term thing that we're going to end up with, besides the sales tax that comes in, that's going to be a huge bump in the impact assistance. But if we want to delve into the boom and bust cycle, like has been discussed several times, we really got to figure out how Carbon County can, can tap into it, not just be an export county, export state. Keep this power in here. Um, they are generating it here and moving it out there, which is good. But if we have ancillary facilities staged here to help fix these uh, wind turbines when they blow down or, or lose a propeller, and they do, um, that'll create diversity and, and jobs within the county and, and help there. We also got to look at, as I mean, going last is always fun, but um, Commissioner Davis tapped on something else too. With the, with the power lines. These, these wind companies, when they come in, they, they build this wind power, but every megawatt of power they use, build, they need a megawatt of base power, coal, natural gas, to, to supplement that when they're, the wind is blowing, it does. Um, we need to, as commissioners and, and public leaders, solicit the, 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 the power companies of Wyoming and the Pacific Corps to see if we can't get natural gas power to base load here. What is your feeling regarding MOUs with the municipality for land use outside of the town limits? Um, Wayne, would you like to go first? I was MOUs outside the uh, incorporated cities to, with the county. Right, planning and zoning. I know the city of Rollins in Carbon County has an MOU in place right now, but uh, the buffer zone is what they call it. Um, I assume they still do. But, 
and, <clears throat> and that's been going on. We even did some inspections out in those areas uh, with the city of Rollins in the county buffer zone area for building codes, fire safety, um, police protection, access, um, and, and all those things. I'm not 100% sure how it works, you know, in the other smaller communities. I know the option is there to uh, come to the county just like we did. And it works for the city of Rollins. I don't know why it wouldn't work for some of the other smaller incorporated towns as well. Yeah. What was the specific question about the Okay. Um, the question that was that we received was what is your feeling regarding MOUs with the municipalities for land use outside of the town limits? So um, current situation is the town of Saratoga is considering taking on the buffer zone and including that in the planning zoning. You know, who should have that? Should that be the town? Should it be the county? Um, and how those maybe those relationships would work should work. Um, anyway, since I did ask um, for provide more information if you would like some additional time. Are you good? Okay. Great. Right. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Because uh, I would absolutely support um, you know further coordination with municipalities um, it's important that uh, as we move forward and we are discussing these things of development and, and uh, affordable housing uh, that we do work with the municipalities on those buffer zones um, I'm not familiar with the current situation with the town of Saratoga um, I do know that uh, there were some revisions made uh, recently um, on on those buffer zones uh, but I do think it's important. I think we've got to work at uh, doing that as our uh, towns and our municipalities are growing um, at, uh, at the rate that they are. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Are you? Okay, I believe that the MOUs do exist, and there are some, um, I think, some rules that, that allow the cities to reach out beyond their radius of their incorporated town limits. I know they're at the, the legislative level in the state of Wyoming right now. The issue is the subdivisions that are occurring outside these municipal boundaries and the overreach of the municipality trying to control what is happening in those subdivisions that are usually governed by homeowners associations. <laughs> So they're, they're, they're trying, I'm not exactly sure where that legislation went, but that, that's a big problem throughout all of Wyoming, especially since everybody wants to have five acres and a horse on it, you know. So I, it, the MOU needs to be a flexible, depending upon the landowner and what the, the question is at that time. <laughs> Um, I believe in the power of communication, and the, the, the more communication we have with the county and the, and the municipalities in Carver County, the better off we'll be. A lot of the land use issues that we deal with are set in Cheyenne at, this, at the legislative level. That being said, we can still create an MOU that's flexible enough to, to help work out things. That like the, the fire, for instance, in in uh, in Larry that took out the trailer court. If they had an MOU in there and maybe solidified a little bit about their water systems, they would have been out of the house. Um, that's just one example. But with ten different communities, municipalities within Carbon County, we've got to work together, and we do. Um, to, to find the, the, the right situation that, that works for each individual. The extraterritorial uh, legislation that Bob um, referred to started out really good, really simple, and then the legislators got a hold of it, and it's no longer quite that. They have attorneys now looking at it to see just how it fits and how it works. So maybe we can, but the power of communication, yes, we need to do an MOU and, and communicate with our Yes, 
One of the things that stimulated the MOU between uh, Carbon County and Rollins was all these economic studies that talked about this dirty ring around the towns. Uh, the entrance ways to Rollins were uh, junkyards because they can get by with it outside of the city limits. It's complicated to do those MOUs because a lot of people don't live in the city, they live out of the county because of all the difference in rules. There's other complicated things, and, and don't get me wrong, I am all for working with the towns, and I'll tell you why, because everybody that lives in town gets to vote for a county commissioner, meaning we represent everybody in town and out of town. It's not just out of town that we represent. So we have to, in my opinion, we it's our obligation to look out for the towns also. Um, but there's other complications, like for instance, fire. Uh, if you give the town a two mile radius, can it include fire? Well, city fire trucks work off of hydrants, and county fire trucks, they take their own fire trucks with them. They have their water tenders and haul their own water. So, so there has to be an agreement between those two fire departments also. I mean, and this can get pretty complex. And then you add the other human element, which is territorialism, and uh, that gets complicated beyond no end. But um, the county, and the cities are, if you look at all the towns and, and the county government, it's one government because everybody that votes for a county commissioner should be represented by the county. So while there's that struggle, to me it's kind of unexplainable. Okay. Last on a tough one. Uh, but I did finally this finally this question finally gives me an idea for the use of in the state statute carbon or the county commissioners are outlined to regulate golf carts. Most golf courses are inside city limits most times and are covered by the city. So this might be one of those uses, part of that MOU if they drive that golf cart in that situation. I'm just joking. But the levels of complexity that go with this. Um, are huge and it, the ripple effects as terry explained the MOU is just the beginning and i think there's a huge wealth of information that we need to explore of other communities that have already done this in other counties what what problems did they run into and why would the MOU be a little bit different in hannah than it would be in medicine bow than it would be in search over than it would be in riverside because it each comes with its own flavor and its own things that, that terry explained um, i think that the, the key there is Communication, communication, and communication, and that has to be the living document that governs that, among other processes that go with the county and the municipalities. Okay, Sue, has anything that there's a question? Okay, Taylor Miller asks, and this is kind of a two-parter here. Taylor Miller asks, what are your experiences with authorizing and preparing budgets. Also, what element of county government do you believe is the most effective? As we've said in the past, uh, we will modify this for a one minute response. Um, let's start with John. One minute. Um, budgets never take one minute. Um, I'm very familiar with budgets. Um, last six years, we've, we've worked through very difficult budgets. Um, so that, that's that's easy one. I have quite a lot of experience there. And the other part of the question was? The other part of the question was, what element of county government do you believe is the most effective? Effective? Sitting up here as a, in a running for county commissioner, I would have to say, uh, those who set the policy, great policy, should be the most effective. Bob. Okay, with the budget process, I just recently helped the commissioners go through the budget process. So I'm a little familiar with one with Carbon County, but with my history, I've been on the Conservation District, the Conservancy District, all of them have budgets that have to go to the commissioners that are part of the new ruling out there now. 
but I've worked <laughs> extensively with M budgets. And then you've got your personal budgets and your business budgets. So I'm kind of budgeted, over budgeted sometimes. <laughs> and as far as the county commissioners are probably the most effective in the government because they not only uh, make the rules or, or things like that, but they, they work on behalf of the people of Carbon County. You know, that we're not alone. We're there for the people to make the best and most sensible <coughs> decision for them. That's kind of in a nutshell. Right. Um, Thank you. See how they're asking us to budget our time. Um, as far as budgeting goes from uh, being a fifth generation rancher, um, somebody that um, has similar uh, experiences um, with budgeting, uh, I don't know anybody that can squeeze blood out of a turnip like a rancher. I mentioned that in our last forum. Um, it's, it's a do or die thing. Um, also running our own business um, with uh, multiple family uh, income properties uh, and as a broker, um, real estate broker. Um, the uh, last question uh, was about the most uh, effective form of government. And uh, as county commissioners, we are Can't think of the word, but we, we deal with the legislative and the executive, so it's important. But I think the entire working group, as we've seen today, the assessor's office, the clerk's office, the sheriff's office, uh, it's a, it's a conglomeration. Thank you. Uh, the, the time I was with the city of Rollins, I was the interim city manager twice for a little over two years, so I had a lot of experience with budget. Um, 20, 30 million dollar type budgets, uh, grant funds over and above that, all kinds of experience dealing with state grants, water development grants, um, and again, my own personal checking account uh, through that. Um, I was on the foundation board of the uh, Wyoming Fire Academy, and there was a time when we helped fund the Wyoming Fire Academy with Buffalo Hunt. That's how funds are represented, the uh, fire service was at the state level. And that has changed after some legislation and people promoting the fire academy versus other areas of the state. So I got to deal with those uh, issues as well. Uh, the most effective part, uh, part of the county government, I didn't think about this question and listen to everybody else. And I guess I would think that the service organizations and everybody that are putting these forums on that are coming out and listening to what we have to offer would be I was an administrator in one school that had a budget of less than $5,000 for a whole year. I also worked in a school that had a lot larger budget than that. At one point in time, uh, when I was serving as a government uh, relations commissioner for the Wyoming Education Association, I thought for a moment that I understood the school funding model coming out of the state. And I, and I had that for about five minutes and they changed it. Um, I've worked as a negotiator for teachers' organizations, for administrators' organizations, and I've looked at all those different types of things. So it ranges from bottom to top, and I've even dabbled a little bit in some of the federal budgeting when I worked there as I moved my way up into supervision. When it comes to the most effective area of government, um, I think a lot of times if you're looking at the county, it depends on which department or which person made the impact and touched someone's life that day. That person believes that department's the most effective. And also, if they don't feel heard, that's the least effective. So in both cases, that can fall equally on the county commissioners. I not only have a, a personal budget, but I have a business budget. The business is a whole lot smaller than it used to be, but we had a uh, a lot of employees, we had to budget. Absolutely, totally dissimilar than doing a county budget. It's, it's a completely different process. 
thank God that there's a county clerk that is a budget officer and, and other commissioners to talk to and all the department heads come and present their budget and that sort of thing. And then the really super tough decisions are made. Probably the least favorite job I had as a county commissioner was at budget time. It's a, it's a tough, tough deal. As far as what part of the county government, uh, what part of the government in general is the most important, it's the people that show up. Um, it reminds me of the body parts fighting. You know, the head says it's it's more important than the heart. The heart says I'll put beating in there for, you know. Anyway, it all ends up bad. It's, it's uh, every piece of it has to work together. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I don't think I need one. This is going back to the buffer zone question. Do you feel that the citizens that fall within that buffer zone, maybe at one mile, two miles, do they have the right to vote for the city officer since the city is going to be kind of in charge of what's going on in that buffer zone? Once again, you have that one minute, so Well, I believe so. Uh, it comes back to the memorandum of understanding. I think that's part of the pieces that we have to look at is who has voice and who doesn't. Is Will there be representation? How will that representation be added to the existing government that's already there? Where will they function within those things? And, and will they have any speech on, you know, fire, water, all those types of things. But yeah, I think people should be included in the MOU, absolutely. <laughs> the opportunity to vote if you live within the buffer zone for the city elected officials, John? That, that was the question? Yeah. I believe that when the MOU is put together, um, and it's similar to an annexation, uh, to do an annexation, you have to come in and prove that you're bringing something to the city. It's not just, I want to be annexed into the city, I'm doing a uh, housing complex, I'm doing this or doing that, or you're bringing a housing complex in, or you bring the water lines, or you bring the sewer lines in. So I would hope that the people that are in that buffer zone provided the information to the county commissioners and got their concerns um, answered through that. And I believe once, when you're in the city and you're paying the city utilities and you're doing that, if you're getting all of those things, then I think you should be annexed in and ask to be annexed in and vote in the city. And if you want the good and the bad of both, not necessarily. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Mr. Zier. Um, I have to agree with the two that have spoken before me. Um, and and the, the importance of it is, is so that they have the input because they're going to be directly affected um, by that. If that, that portion of the buffer zone is changed or, or annexed into the city, for example, um, then they become part of that municipality. Um, and I think the way that you vote it's twofold. Uh, you show up to the meetings uh, and, and state your opinion and your, your uh, position uh, when those MOUs are being discussed. And then secondly, uh, you show up the polls and uh, vote for your favorite county commissioner. Okay, uh, this is kind of a question near and dear to my heart. There's a flip-flop to this too. What if you own a uh, business in the community and live outside of the community? Do you fall under the regulation of that community as a business owner? So it's a difficult question here. You know, uh, we have that same issue down in our community. I think if you structure an MOU to address those situations, that would be the, probably the best way to to work through that. But I think it's not a problem that can be easily worked through because if you've got a lot of constituents not around that boundary, you know, depends how far you extend that boundary out. Uh, 
John, that's a great question. Um, and that's exactly where the legislation was created to address that situation. Um, there's a process for them to vote. Um, you get annexed, and then you can vote within the city. If you can't, then you don't, and that, that's out of our realm. Do I think they should? Um, only if they're willing to be regulated by that municipality. A lot of people live out in the county because they don't want that regulation. Um, they want to live out in the county. They don't want to have, you know, live under the same guidelines and, and structure that the municipalities do. So I think they need a voice. And as I think uh, Candidate Stalin said, they, they come to the, the meetings when they're discussing these issues and then they can have their voice heard. Um, if they do a poll, uh, random, then, then they can vote that way. But as far as that, I think they can't vote unless they're annexed. But that's a good question. As I mentioned before, it's very complex when you start doing that, that buffer zone thing. One of the things I remember about when it was done with Rollins was that um, there was an automatic agreement that uh, some of the people that live out in that buffer zone actually could participate and be board members to the planning and zoning commission. They, they didn't get all of the benefits of being annexed. They didn't get city water, city sewer, uh, fire protection, like I mentioned, uh, police protection, that was all done through the sheriff and that sort of thing. Um, but the one thing that did affect them on this MOU was, was building codes and some of those type of items. And in that particular case, for that town, the circumstances said that uh, they should appoint people to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, like in Rollins, Malcolm Watson lives out on Cherokee Road. He's been a a uh, member of the Planning and Zoning Commission for Rollins for a long time. It's, uh, it's a very complex issue. Like to thank everyone for coming, and particularly the candidates. Without them, we wouldn't have had this information. And I encourage everyone to vote. The primary is August 21st. You can register right up through the day you vote. Uh, you can get ballots mailed to you um, anytime you get county clerks. I think uh, they put out quite a few so far. And so please vote. This is the most important election, is the primary. This is where people are eliminated from the race. And a lot of times we wonder how we got this dud that's serving down the line. And it's because we didn't vote in the primary. And then they ended up in the general with no competition. And so it's about we the people, and we the people need to participate. And it takes a huge amount of courage to stand up and run for one of these offices. It's the biggest, meanest job interview you will ever have in your whole life. And then when you have the privilege to serve, it's a whole other story. Um, so I thank them all very much, every one of them. And we have sample ballots for the Saratoga area um, in and out on the back. Uh, the candidates have brought all their swag, and so um, thank you. But once again, and just as an FYI, the MOU is a hot topic. There's a workshop for Saratoga's MOU next Tuesday, and as your county commission liaison to planning and zoning, I shall be there, and we will have a chitty chat. So um, show us at the town, five what? Five thirty, town hall. Yeah,